If you want to play the Yakuza games in chronological order, it goes 0, Kiwami, Kiwami 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which is Yakuza Like a Dragon, and then this one, The Man Who Erased His Name. This game takes place after Yakuza 6 and at about the same time as 7, but starring Kiryu instead of Ishiban. You should play 7 before you play this. Technically, you don't need to, but playing through this will spoil a ton about 7's ending. Even ignoring the plot on the gameplay side of things, which we're about to get into, this isn't a good starting point either. With that in mind, let's dive into the man who erased his name. There won't be any major spoilers in this video beyond introductions to the plot. So the plot. So following the events of Yakuza 6, Kiryu ends up faking his death and going into hiding in order to protect the kids at the Morning Glory Orphanage. He signs a pact with the Daijuji faction to become their disciple and now operates under a new name, Joryu. He's done with all the Yakuza nonsense and now spends most of his time meditating in a Buddhist temple in his free time and working small jobs for his Daijuji handler Hanawa in exchange for funding the orphanage, anonymously. Joryu's disguise in public throughout the entire game is just Kiryu in a pair of sunglasses, which makes him unrecognizable to everybody, in theory. But in reality, almost everybody in this game instantly recognizes him as Kiryu, which never failed to make me laugh. It's just so dumb. Anyway, the piece doesn't last. The first mission of the game sees Joryu acting as security for a smuggling operation in Yokohama. This turns out to be a trap from a certain Yakuza clan to kidnap Hanawa. Reason being that word got out that Hanawa knows that Kiryu is alive. Kiryu gets recognized at the job and things go off the rails from there. Unfortunately, that's about all I want to say here. What proceeds though is a 10 to 15 hour story involving the Omi Alliance, the Tojo clan, and an epic finale that'll leave you legitimately crying if you've become invested in this story. The story is a solid 10 out of 10 and I can't emphasize that enough, but let's get into the gameplay. So combat. The fighting system has two combat stances. You've got Dragon Style, which plays similar to Dragon Style in other games, and then you've got the new one, which is Agent. You want to use Dragon for one-on-one -on -one encounters and heavier enemies, and then use Agent if there's a ton of enemies on the screen that you want to do damage to. I found it beneficial to switch to Agent at the start of battles to get a bit of a head start on their health bars, so what is Agent? Throughout the campaign, Joryu ends up collecting a ton of gadgets that you can use in battle. All of them have unlimited ammo and are just on a bit of a timer for how often you can use them. He's got a barrage of drones that he can call in to fly into enemies' heads, which stuns them temporarily and causes a bit of damage. Then he's got these really cool cigarettes that are actually explosives. They're grenades, basically. You can spam throw these and lure enemies into them before they explode. He's got jet-propelled boots, which do exactly what you think they do. And then this cool Spider-Man web thing, which has a ton of uses. You can toss enemies into other enemies, lasso them up, pull them towards you and punch them in the face, or even use it to get up to elevated places at scripted times. It's really sick. Normal punching and kicking combat when you're in an agent stance doesn't do a ton of damage, but it's decent for getting you out of tricky situations until you can jet boot away from them all. Agent is very much a stay back stance. Dragon on the other hand, combos are really similar to Yakuza 6, but definitely quite a bit clunkier. Kiryu's getting old, I guess, to be fair, but the clunky combat also rings true for the agent style. You can't even parry enemies without a skill tree upgrade, and in Agent, you can't parry at all unless you're in extreme heat. Which is a bit of a shame. Combat's a huge focus on this particular game, with a much smaller map and much less side content. It's really the thing that should have been perfected. On that note, the map. The entire game takes place in the Sottenbury district of Osaka, with just a couple streets to wander around. There's only the one city, as well as a new area called the castle, which we'll talk about soon. Sottenbury, despite being small, is still filled to the brim with things that can keep you distracted for hours. The Gambler's Hall and the Casino are full of gambling games like Blackjack and the like. There's still Mahjong on the street too, unfortunately. Billards has a ton of different modes, including 9-ball, 8-ball, and 4-ball, as well as a really cool trick shot mode. Seriously, this is one of the best pool games I've ever played. Darts is hard as hell, but extremely fun, demanding the most precise movements to fight the analog stick while watching the power meter. Golf is simple and has two modes, closest to the pin and bingo challenge. Bingo is where you hit the ball towards a grid to knock out the numbers in a bingo formation, and the closest to the pin is, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. The cabaret club is even more uncomfortable this time, using live-action FMVs for the girls to let you pick different dialogue options and give gifts to them to make them fall for you. The arcade could have its own video about it, but for now, it's got Virtua Fighter 2.1, Fighting Vipers 2, Sonic the Fighters, Motor Raid, The Crane Game, and amazingly, the very first re-release of The Cabinet of Daytona 2, now renamed Sega Racing Classic 2. On that note, there's also a Sega Master System that you can play games on. Pocket Circuit Racing's back, with the usual absurd attention to detail with parts and pieces to build your RC car being found around the city or buying them at the pro shop store. Karaoke's back, with a bunch of classics like Back in Matai, Like a Butterfly, and even a new Christmas song to sing. There's online leaderboards for these too. And then last up, we have the absolute biggest of the bunch. 
It's a bit of a minor spoiler, I suppose, but the castle is essentially Epstein's Island. It's a hidden city on an extremely large shipping boat where all the rich and prestigious people go to live out their wildest fantasies. That's all I'll say, but one of the mini games on here is the Colosseum. This is by far the most in-depth of the games here and could easily be its own video game. The Colosseum takes place in the castle and has a bunch of different modes to play and some of the best combat challenges the series has to offer. Look, it's crazy. He fights tigers again, too. There's Hell Team Rumble. This is where you can go out into the open world and recruit fighters to join your team for team-based brawls in the Colosseum and get this, you can even play as them and they all have their own movesets. That means you can play as Kazuma, Majima, Saijima, and a ton of other characters from previous games, including Judgment. There's special events that let you have a boss battle against them too. There's Hell Rumble, which are time trials. I'm gonna cut this here, but know that you can easily get addicted to the Colosseum mode and end up spending hours here before you even realize it. Anyway, you want to play as many of these as you can, because you get boatloads of money for doing so, and you'll often find people in need placed around these minigames, which gives you Akami points. More on that, right now. Money comes extremely easily here. You get an absurd amount of money just for street fights. The upgrades on the upgrade tree need to be purchased with money, but you also need to use Akami points to buy them, which, in order to get those, you need to complete both a series of really good side missions, each with their own story, as well as help the homeless and people around town. The Akami missions are absolutely fantastic. You've got stuff like this guy, Kusuno, who's trying to get a girlfriend using AI to talk to her. Meanwhile, the AI keeps telling him to do stupid nonsense and Joryu has to help him out. Stuff like that. Most of these missions result in an additional person to help you out in the Colosseum too, they join your team. Including a complete sub-story involving Kaido and Higashi from the Judgment games. God, this game is so good. You use your Spider-Man thing to get lost items back for people, fight people, whatever. Those ones are alright, but there's a crazy number of these homeless people that just want you to find a store that sells an oddly specific item, walk to the store, buy the item, and then bring it to them. These give you Akami points, but holy Christ, it's the worst part of the game. That was a pretty rapid fire review of this game, but that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Like a Dragon Gaiden is a really good game and a fantastic Yakuza game. It's got some rough edges here and there, but the amount of content that you get for the budget price is unquestionably worth it. Yes, the main story is a bit on the shorter side of things, but that really just makes it easier to 100% the game, which kind of makes it more fun. Also, the ending's still gonna make you cry. It's worth playing just for that. But thanks for watching the video, guys. If you click the subscribe button or even just the like button, I'll be pretty stoked. But until next time, love you guys and peace.